Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the, what month is this? October already? October Planning, Development, and Environmental Quality Committee. And uh, do we have any public comments in person or online? Okay, moving right along. Any changes to the agenda? All right, why don't we skip right to uh, meeting minutes approval from September 26th. There was one manifest uh, thing, so we don't need to bring that up, but thanks for catching that, Deborah. Uh, so would someone like to move the minutes of September 26th? Greg and Deborah seconded that. All in, let's see, I just wanna make sure we don't have uh, Henry on, on Zoom, right? Okay, so just everybody's here. All right, all those in favor? Okay, that passes unanimously. Advisory board appointments, we have one today, and that's to the Strategic Tourism Planning Board, Barbara Romano. Term expires December 31st, 2025. Moved by Greg, seconded by Deborah. All those in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. Uh, chair's report. Uh, the only thing I have right now is I uh, just want to remind folks of the meetings for PDEC for the rest of the year. The next one in November is still the fourth Monday of the month, the 28th. But the one in December, we uh, moved as of last meeting, we talked about it. That one is moved to the third Monday of the month. That's December 19th. And that's to accommodate some holidays that would be occurring during the regular meeting, uh, Christmas and Kwanzaa. Then we're on to our county administrator's report. And I believe Lisa is going is trying to attend remotely. There she is. Uh, hi. She's before you. Uh, hi, Lisa. Before you go in there, I, I should say that uh, we do have a lot of things on our agenda today. So I'm going to try to keep moving people very crisp. So if there is uh, something you know, keep the questions down to a minimum, keep them very pertinent, and let's just keep moving along so we can make sure I have a meeting, another meeting at 3.30, the time that this one ends, so I wanna make sure, and I know some other people have other obligations, so we'll make sure we uh, move along. And uh, Lisa, what do you have for us today? Hey, bada bing, bada boom. Um, I have just a couple of quick items. Um, again, just wanted to acknowledge last Wednesday, um, the 19th, we had a kickoff of the green facilities uh, project for the county at the public works building with Johnson Controls. And I think that was a, a very nice um, commemoration of the, the start of, of our um, capital project on green facilities. And I think that was very well received. Then this coming Thursday, the 27th, um, the, um, the planning um, staff has arranged for a walkthrough of the 408 North Tioga Street building, the Red House, um, and has opened that for legislators to have an opportunity to see the interior of the building and ask questions of staff, um, historic Ithaca staff, and some city, city staff will be there as well. So that's 11 11 o'clock this Thursday, the 27th. So I hope folks can attend that. That's all I have for this morning, this afternoon. All right, thanks, Lisa. Any questions for Lisa? Okay, don't mean you have to be that crisp. You could, folks could ask a <laughs> short question once in a while. Uh, let's uh, move right on. We have uh, Barbara Ekstrom from uh, Recycling Materials Management Department. How are you doing today? Doing well, how about yourselves? Great, enjoying the sunshine. So um, what I have in front of you, for those of you who are new, is a resolution that this time of year we always uh, provide, which sets the annual fees for all the categories that pay. Unlike property taxes, the tax exempt pay, uh, the, the colleges, universities, and schools. And what you have in front of you is a schedule of the rates starting with the $80 residential fee and going all the way through 
to the various categories. Um, I also provided with you with information about how the fee is calculated. There's a number of departments in county government that work together on this fee, um, finance, assessment, and our office primarily. And what we have is also the, the annual fee for schools, colleges, and universities uh, that have gone by a formula for many years. Um, I guess what I'd like to do is answer any specific questions. I do have a couple um, of things I wanted to mention um, as well. So are there any questions for me? Right, well, first we'll uh, move the resolution onto Thank the floor you. and then we'll open it up for questions. That's on packet page 10. It's the resolution uh, doc ID 11244, establishing a unit charge for 2023 solid waste annual fee. Would someone like to move that? Randy, seconded by Deborah. So as Barb said, any questions? Deb? Yeah, hi, Barb. Nice to see hi, you. Hi, Deb. Nice to see you too. I just wanted to be sure I understand. We approved a fee as part of our budget. And, Correct. And this is just kind of an extension off of that? Well, what we do every year is we, we establish what the unit charge is, okay? And from the unit charge for residents, there are other fees for businesses, they are by the square foot, for colleges by a formula, and then there's other categories like recreation and warehouse. I have Jackie Maloney, who's our fiscal coordinator here. Um, Jackie, do you know what the total amount is that we are billing for? Is that $4.3 million, do you know? It's 4.6. $4.6 million, okay. And, you know, and the budget, the rest of the uh, funding is disposal fees. Remember, this pays for non-disposal charges for our recycling programs, our capital investments, our old landfills, household hazards, waste, food scraps, and so much more. I hope I not only answered your question, but also gave some more detail about the fee. Yes, thanks, Barb. You're welcome. And Greg has a question. Yeah, th thanks, Barb. I'm just curious. It, so it looks like for the the single home uh, parcel, the cost from 2021, 2022, 2023 has gone up by about five dollars. But if I'm looking on packet page 12, it looks like the colleges ah, yeah. have, have decreased. Okay, you're right in the smack of it. Thank you for asking that question. There's a different basis for how all these fees get calculated. Um, and uh, one of the things I wanted to, that's right, so you're right. It, their formula has to do entirely with the, their share of old landfill costs, capital costs, recycling costs, and, and those sorts of things they don't contribute based on the original agreement to the to certain programs that are only available to residents. Now, here's something very, very important and um, it's important for the committee to know. Lisa has formed a team of a number of departments that are gonna be re-examining the annual fee structure which was originally done by Mike Lane and a, and a committee of, you know, county department heads and legislators um, a million years ago. I think it was about 25 to 30 years ago. We have noticed as our programs have grown that there are things that aren't included in the college fees that need to be reexamined. The original philosophy um, that was quite frankly um, negotiated primarily with a guy by the name of John Gutenberger, who is the uh, Cornell and city of Ithaca mayor, myself and a few other key people from colleges, basically talked about the opportunity to recycle. 
and what would be available to the colleges, as well as paying for what they dumped into the old landfills that we now need to um, clean up. But over the years, I've had a number of ideas, and I'm sure others have, about how to restructure this fee for equity. And that's the work that we are, we are uh, starting in November, and we're going to be continuing it for probably about six months so that we can make recommendations formal, formally to the appropriate committee or committees. It'll probably be this committee, if I'm serving this committee, and the budget committee, and on to the legislature. So there's, there's a lot to this that will need to be re-examined. Do we have an MOU with the colleges for- We do not. It was a gentleman's agreement. And it, it, the goal here is to actually have an MOU with the colleges and the schools. So I, I, I'm gonna keep this crisp. I, str I struggle with the lowering costs in higher ed and the increasing costs on the average taxpayer. Same um, here. I'm just going to get that one out there. I mean, it's 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 dramatic. It's it's seventy one thousand dollars over the course of the year. If but it's not are, random. It's not random. It, no, no, it, I, I know it's it, not random. It's, yeah. it's it's flawed, and I and we should yeah. we should. Yeah. We well, need don't to, assume it's flawed. I, I don't think you can yeah. assume that. I think you should really know what what's going on. Let me tell you why the fee has gone down. The fee has gone down because the debt has been retired on the old landfill closure. That was a very significant part of their fee, okay? And the other thing is that the amount of recycling is based, and I think you can call this one a flaw, is based on the tonnage that they deliver, which has not increased in the amount it had before. But Greg, your point about how this fee needs careful examination and legislative policy attention is absolutely right on the money. And that's the process we're kicking off. And Lisa, you might want to speak to it about how the legislators will get involved in this. Yeah, so um, we preliminarily were going to to meet with departments for, for me to get an understanding, a more of an understanding about um, the structure of this fee and the, the history behind it, but certainly um, we'll want to have um, legislator involvement and ultimately we will be bringing forth a recommendation for this committee budget and the the full legislature to um to react to and and hopefully a resolution to pass so um i just needed preliminarily to understand from departments what all was involved in this but would like to um have representation certainly from pdac and the budget committee to uh to be a part of of these discussions going forward which is exactly what we did with Mike, uh, you know, through the F and I committee. And uh, rest assured that every voice will be heard. Though there will need to be a negotiating team when there's a recommendation with the colleges. Um, but I wanted to make mention of this now because we need to do a lot of work before I leave at the end of March. And Jackie Maloney, who is my fiscal coordinator, will also be involved. Bill Troy, attorney, Jonathan was involved. Um, Jay Franklin, assessment, very involved. Jay actually helped us to create some of these fees when he was just a project assistant many years ago. Um, and then there'll be um, the new um, financial director. And I might have left some people out, but it is a really big deal. And it really requires change. So we'll look forward to, you know, hearing more about that as, as the year goes by. So thank, thank you for the update on that. Any other questions before we vote on this resolution? All those in favor? All those against? Okay, did you get that, Brittany? Okay, so that passes three in favor, one against. 
And the next resolution is on page 14. And that's the audit of final payment. Paul F. Fatali Incorporated Recycling and Solid Waste Center Pavement Project, DOC ID 11245. Would someone like to move that one? Get it on the floor. Deborah, seconded by Greg. And uh, do you want to give us a short uh, recap on this, Barb? Yeah, this is plain and simple. We had a contractor come in through a bid who did the paving at the recycling center. I mentioned to you at the last meeting that we wound up having about a 3% change order on this project. It went really well. The work's done. We're releasing final payment. Any questions? All those in favor? That passes unanimously. Thank you, everybody. And there was an information item uh, for capital payments summary. Did you need to say anything about that, Barbara? You just wanted me to see if there's any questions? Any questions? Okay, did you wanna say anything, Barb, or? Yeah, this will take okay. a minute. So this is something that came as a big surprise to me. I just received a letter last week from uh, Cornell. I am receiving an award of recognition for my leadership in reducing waste in the community by Cornell at their annual awards ceremony. Um, I received an email. I'm going to accept the award. I'm honored, I'm, I'm shocked, and I'm gonna be sharing uh, information with those that, that wanna listen. Unfortunately, it's happening the day after I have my second cataract surgery, but my husband said I need to do, it's remote anyway, so I need to show up, so. <laughs> Well, I'm honored, uh, you know, from the county, you know, on your behalf, and I, I personally am not shocked. I am, but, uh, so I'm glad you're you're getting that honor. Well, we'll see how it goes. Deserved. Yeah, well deserved. We should put up a statue. About, oh, stuck you know, but it'd have to be yeah, a, a, a statue, a statue of right. a pile of waste, right? right? That went away. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's really pretty cool, actually. I I didn't even think. They liked me, so. <laughs> what is that, uh, Sally Field? They like me. You you like me. You really you, like. You me. really like me. So thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm going to be listening into the solar project. Okay, great. Thank, thank you very you. much. Okay, uh, on to the planning and sustainability department. And let's see, Darby, I, would you like to give us the uh, update on the status of the building code administration study? I believe that's what you're here for, right? Yes, that's where okay. we're kicking off. So hello, Darby Kiley from Planning and Sustainability and here to talk about the status of the building co code administration study. The request for proposals went out about a month ago, and just last week we received the proposals. We have four of them, and uh, we decided to interview all four because they're really excellent proposals, and, and we're excited to hear from the, the consultant teams on what they're proposing. So we'll be holding those interviews this week and next week. And just so you know who is on the steering committee, it includes, uh, I think it's six county staff, uh, me and Katie from Planning and Sustainability, Liz Cameron from Environmental Health, Alana Cogden from the Clerk's Office, Jay Franklin from Assessment, and Bridget Nugent from Administration. And then we also include three municipal partners. So we have CJ Randall, who's the Director of Planning for the Town of Lansing, Marty Mosley, the director of code enforcement in the town of Ithaca, and Mark Whitmer, who's the supervisor in the town of Caroline. So that's the steering committee. Um, and we'll be starting those interviews tomorrow. So I'll take any questions. All right, thank you, Darby. Any questions, comments? All righty. I guess we're all set. Thank you, Darby. And I'm going right. to be trucking along. I really do appreciate you giving us uh, periodic updates on this. Yeah, Can we'll we'll know much more. more. We'll need to have the contract signed uh, by mid-December, so we'll provide more updates soon after that. Okay, great. And you know, especially since a lot of us go to our municipal meetings, so that's it's great that we're updated on that. Yeah. 
All righty. Uh, anything else that you have for us today? I'm next on your agenda as well. The okay. um, yep. So as you move on, I'll I'll be here. Okay. Um, so this is packet page 19. So why don't we get this on the floor first? This is uh, doc ID 11249, a resolution to authorize funding for the housing affordability and supportive infrastructure grant program for 2022. Would someone move that? Deborah seconded by Greg. And uh, go ahead, Darby. Yeah, I, I will mostly just leave it up for you guys to ask questions uh, because as Annie mentioned, the uh, resolution starts on page 19 and that's followed by a, a detailed memo about our evaluation of the application from the town of Danby and then also includes the program guidelines. So in the effort to keep it crisp, I'll just take any questions that you might have on the program or on the proposal before you. Um, one, one question. Uh... Um, Greg and I were talking about before the meeting, just thinking about because this is housing, has to do with housing, is this something that um, we think should keep coming through PDEC or should it go through HHS? I think because it actually has a housing or infrastructure component, so someone could be applying for infrastructure, that's why we've kept it in um, PDEC, but yeah, previously had gone to HED. So okay. um, we can we can look at the program as it moves forward, um, if it moves forward next year, depending on the budget outcome. Mm -hmm. That's true. It's often uh, or that's one of the things that uh, was thought of with the program is that it could help, like you said, with infrastructure, uh, which would probably fall more under PDEC than than HHS. Any uh, Randy has a question or comment? Yes. Hi, Darby. Uh, so the $15,000, is that funded every year? Is that the... It has been. So the program originally started in 2019, and I think there was $45,000 in the program. Um, and then 2020, the, the, the money was um, held off because of the pandemic. And then uh, again, last year was 15,000 and this year is 15,000. So, I, and I think that's what's in the budget for 2023. Any other questions? All those in favor? That passes unanimously. Thank you, Darby. Do you have another one or is that it for today? That's it for me. Thank you. Alrighty. Well, great. Great to see you. Let's see. The next uh, resolution we have is on packet page 29. And um, Katie, I forgot to ask you if you had any update. We didn't really have that written on here. Do you have any updates from your the planning department before we keep going on? No, the only other thing I'd add is just that um, both uh, Darby and Nick are planning to go to the TCOG meeting uh, Thursday afternoon. Uh, Nick will update them on the broadband and what's going on. You you guys were updated on really the, the bulk of it at last month's meeting. Um, and Darby's going to be giving the same update on the um, uh, code study. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, let's see. Uh, the next resolution, packet page 29, doc ID 1148, making a negative determination of environmental significance in relation to resolution number, which we don't have yet, approaching, uh, I'm sorry, appropriating funds from the Tompkins County Natural Infrastructure Capital Program for the acquisition of the Meadowbrook addition to Fisher Old Growth Forest Natural Area. Could someone move that? Randy, seconded by Deborah, and third by Greg. Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, who would want to talk about this? Uh, sometimes it's Nick or Katie who or Joan. I see Joan there too. It's me Joan. today. Joan today. Okay, <laughs> great. What do you got, Joan? Okay, I'm um, going to go ahead and share my screen. Don't know if you can see this. It's not. Uh, try again. Okay, try okay. again. I'll get there.
Can you see the slideshow? I don't think you, maybe you can. We can see it, but it's not full screen. Gotcha. There we go. Yeah, that's it. Much better. Great. Thank you. Um, so a very, very brief presentation. This is actually designed to help me keep it short. So um, I won't be adding any material that's not in your agenda package, but just to give you a two cent overview. Um, the site uh, that's proposed for acquisition is immediately adjacent to the existing Fisher Old Growth uh, Forest Natural Area in Newfield. It's 81 acres. Now, Cornell University would hold the title, but the property would be managed by Cornell Botanic Gardens. And in addition to that, the Finger Lakes Land Trust will be holding a conservation easement on the property to provide for long-term protection of the property. Um, there are a lot of natural resources located on this site. Um, the uh, forest resources that are um, included in the Fisher Old Growth Forest extend beyond the boundary, as you can imagine, and include um, uh, quite a diversity of tree species on these adjoining properties. In addition, there's a major wetland uh, complex on the eastern, uh, the property that adjoins the existing uh, unique area to the east. Um, the area is also already designated in several locations in Tompkins County planning documents. It's part of the gorgeous natural features focus area. It was specifically identified as a priority protection area in the county's conservation strategy. And it's also a unique natural area that has been identified by the Environmental Management Council. Um, the request for funding is a total of $36,790, uh, which meets the guidelines for uh, not exceeding one third the assessed value of the property. And the current balance in the capital budget is uh, over $900,000. So there are, there are funds available to um, fund this request. Questions? Randy, and then Deborah. Yes, thanks, Joan. Um, did the town of Newfield weigh in on this at all? Um, I don't, I know they were approached. I don't know if we ever had, if there was ever a response from them. I'm looking right now to see if Todd is on, has joined us from Cornell. It takes silence, I can't see. It takes silence as he is not here. I know he did say that they had notified the town but I don't recall uh, ever hearing any specific input from the town, one way or the other. Okay, um, I'm familiar with this site. Um, uh, I've walked it, uh, it's been a few years. Uh, as you know, as a trailer park, uh, a good portion of it was for quite a while and it flooded a lot, which is why it's no longer a, a trailer park. Um, the, uh, my only issue is, is that you know, we're, uh, again, paying something that Cornell is going to own. And to my knowledge, Cornell has never, ever approached anybody in Newfield School about participating in, in wandering the site or um, um, and it's typical, typical, I guess, uh, that you have this beautiful area with uh, old growth forest, which is really awesome. I really encourage people to, to walk it. It really is really awesome in, in some areas, but they made no effort to, uh, to uh, approach anybody at Newfield. So I just want to share that. Uh, just a second, Deborah. So just wondering, following up on what Randy said, Joan, you had said that possibly somebody from Cornell was going to be here today. Is that correct? I was hoping that um, Todd from Cornell Botanic Gardens would be joining us today. I don't know if we're ahead of schedule. We are a little ahead we're, of schedule. We are a little bit ahead of schedule. So, so. he might be joining us um, in a few minutes. So he, if he uh, joins us today, that'd be a question we could ask him. And I like, uh, you know, I like that you brought that up, Randy. So I appreciate that. And if not, uh, let's see if we can follow up either outside of this or have him come to the legislative meeting, but maybe we can, you know, have a communication afterwards. I did see the person's information in his email there. So. 
Okay. And uh, I would just, oh, if I can add quickly, and um, I would uh, be happy to share that concern, Randy, with uh, Todd Bittner um, from Cornell, because I agree it's a beautiful area and uh, just encourage him to try to involve local schools. Thank you. Deborah? Yeah, kind of a related series of questions. Is the Cornell Botanical Gardens separate and distinct from the university? Or is it just part of the larger university? It's part of the larger university. So the uh, Todd's just joined us. Um, so the, the Cornell University will be the holder of the property, but the property would be managed by Cornell Botanic Gardens. Hi, Todd, we got started a little earlier than anticipated, and there've been a couple of questions. Sorry, I, I didn't realize I needed to be here sooner, but thank you for having me. I've already gone over a little bit of uh, information about the uh, proposal and um, I'll leave it up to the chair to decide if she wants to go back to the questions now. Thanks, Joan. Uh, thanks, Todd, for joining us today. And uh, we had up our, uh, my colleague, uh, Randy Brown from, he represents the town of uh, Newfield and he had a, had a question for you. Uh, yes, Todd. Uh, I have no issue with protecting the property. I've, I've walked it. It really is awesome. But to my knowledge, Cornell has never approached any uh, the school district any time to get the kids to participate in in that natural resource. And do you have any plans to do anything like that? Uh, you're correct. Um, we haven't uh, engaged with the uh, the Newfield School District. Um, would, would be happy to. Um, it's great when we have uh, youth and, and uh, volunteer stewards that uh, take care of areas. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you have a good point of contact uh, with, a, with the school that I could I work with. I'm, I, I tell folks I have more neighbors in Tompkins County than anyone else. We actually have 93 miles worth of, of property boundaries. So um, even though I know quite a few people, I don't uh, have contacts in every school district. Okay, I'll reach out to you. Thanks, Todd. Yeah, uh, Randy noted your email is, is in the uh, packet, so uh, he'll follow up with you. Great. Any other questions, Deborah? Yeah, I wasn't really finished. Oh, sorry. Um, that's okay. So I I'm trying to understand this transaction. <laughs> the land is being donated to Cornell, right? Yeah, correct. And so I guess I'm curious to know what the $36,000, $37,000 is going to be used for. Sure. Um, so to be eligible for the, uh, for the county's grant, uh, it requires a, uh, a conservation easement. So we've made arrangements with the Finger Lakes Land Trust uh, to secure that easement. They uh, require uh, an endowment. Uh, to go into the, uh, their uh, general endowment funds to protect uh, against future uh, uh, litigation, future uh, infractions, uh, enforcement issues that may arise, um, not just from the original uh, easement holder, um, but future ones as well, uh, because the land can, uh, uh, you know, in any of their uh, easements can be sold. And they uh, require an assessment of the condition of the land and uh, some fees to be able to put the easement together. Uh, the land, so that's fifteen thousand of the uh, of the requested budget. Uh, the Botanic Gardens has agreed to uh, cover our uh, closing costs that are typical of uh, a buyer in a, a regular uh, uh, transaction. So we have legal fees. Uh, to cover, uh, we have uh, title and uh, filing fees that we'll be uh, 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 covering with the grant. Uh, there's also uh, uh, taxes. Um, we uh, will apply for a tax exempt status for the property as an educational institution, but that um, isn't granted until uh, the summer. And so there'll be a period of time where there won't, uh, that, that, that uh, uh, we'll be responsible for paying uh, remaining property taxes. Um, and uh, the 
uh, donor, Meadowbrook LLC, has agreed to um, donate and cover the uh, closing costs uh, typical of the seller for the 68 acres, but not for the 13 acres. So we're going to be covering the uh, the, the uh, closing costs of the donor uh, for part of the property, and that also includes a legal survey uh, that actually is is underway as we speak. And um, and then we are seeking additional funds for what we call as startup funds. So uh, posting the boundary with uh, po posting the property boundary, uh, cleaning up uh, trash and, and refuse, controlling invasive species. Uh, there's a trail that we want to reroute on the property, and some of the grant funds will will cover that. So the the aggregate of that is the uh, the grant funds that we're seeking. Okay, um, well, I don't doubt that this is worthwhile and I know that we have sufficient funds in this, um, in this capital program. I just, and, and I'm not gonna vote against this, but I would say, you know, from the county's perspective that it just seems odd that an institution with a $5 billion annual budget is coming to us for $36,000 to close on a deal where they're getting free land. Um, just a thought, thank you. Anything else? Okay, all right. Uh, so this is the resolution making the negative uh, declaration. And so all those in favor? That passes. The next resolution is appropriating the funds uh, for this. This, um, let's see, what page is that? I don't have the right number here. Back at page 36. Thank you. And this is a resolution appropriating the funds from the Tompkins County Natural Infrastructure Capital Program for the acquisition of the Meadowbrook addition to the Fisher Old Growth Forest Natural Area, DOC ID 11247. Would someone like to move that? Randy, seconded by Greg. Okay. Anything else you want to say about this, uh, Joan or Todd? No, nothing. Thank you. Okay. No, nothing here either. Thank you. All righty. Um, I just uh, want to add one thing that I know it might seem unusual, but I have seen, you know, for land acquisition money going from, you know, from one organization to another to help, you know, uh, acquire these different lands. And I think, you know, the, to me, the most important thing is that we are figuring out how to how to do this together, and uh, it adds a nice uh, parcel around the current lands and helps you know expand the 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 preservation of the natural areas. So I so I'm I'm glad to to see that. So all those in favor? Okay, that passes unanimously. Todd, thank you very much for coming today, and Joan, thank you for the uh, presentation. Thank, Thank you for you your all. time today. Yep. Okay. And Terry, would you like to come up to the table? Sure. So hello. We're going to be joined by a couple of visitors here. Ed's going to be to my right. I'm going to set him up with the, the Zoom. So just give me a second. We're here to talk to you today about the uh, Caswell Solar close, or what we're calling Caswell Solar. It's the closed landfill proposal to put solar on that closed landfill. So I'll turn it over to Ed now, who can introduce himself and, and our other uh, friend here, and then we'll go from there. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for having us today. I know you've got a lot on your agenda and need to get out of here by 3.30, so we'll be kind of quick and uh, to the point. But my name is Ed Flynn. I'm the Director of Planning for Labella Associates, and we have been engaged by the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, also known as NYSERDA, uh, to identify, screen, and help develop uh, difficult sites for solar development. So those could be brownfields, landfills, um, quarries, things like that. So 
Today, we're here to talk about uh, what's called the Caswell Solar Slate, also known as Ithaca North Landfill at 527 Caswell Road in the town of Dryden. And I'm gonna, most of the presentation will be Gillian Black from NYSERDA, so I'll let him introduce himself right now. Hi, my name is Gillian Black. I'm the director of the Build Ready program at NYSERDA. I'll go into more detail in a bit. Correctly. All right, so um, we'll go into introductions. We have some other folks uh, virtually that are attending today from our team. Um, and I also want to thank Terry uh, and his team for getting us together and coordinating all this, as well as Barb and others from the planning department. Um, Gillian's going to start off with the Build a Ready program overview, so you know what uh, the program's all about. And we're going to provide an example, which is called the Benson Mines Project, which is one of the first sites that's going to get out of the gate for the program. Um, then I'm going to talk, come back and talk about the Tompkins landfill site, also known as the Caswell Solar Site. And then we have a brief session with frequently asked questions and next steps. And then we'll have some time for questions. All right. So Gillian introduced himself. Do you want to introduce things anymore before we go? Sure. On the, on the call, we have Harrison Kim, who is a uh, project manager in charge of originating sites. And I believe we also have uh another team member emily who's just come back from maternity leave so we're psyched and then tom can 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 make it today that's right um and we from labella we also have lucia Wu, who's uh attending virtually <laughs> so she'll be here to answer any questions that i can answer um so i'm gonna hand it over to gillian he's gonna talk a little bit about the build ready program sure thanks ed um as everyone may or may not know, we have the CLCPA, uh, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, where the state has codified some of these goals into law. Um, the one that we're focusing on as a department is trying to hit 70% renewables by 2030. Um, this Build Ready program was developed because there are many sites throughout the state that would be perfect for renewable energy, but for whatever reason, they're too expensive to develop by the private sector. So we've been put into place to address these sites, to work with local municipalities and other sister state agencies, um, to act as a private developer within NYSERDA, spend all of the time and money getting the project ready to build, and then we put it out to the private sector in an auction or a tender, and the private sector bids on it. We attach to the project that we are selling a renewable energy certificate, which uh, the value of which we can increase to offset the costs of the project. I'll go into a little more detail. We focus on landfills, brownfields, uh, adjacent vacant sites, abandoned sites, uh, former fossil fuel generators, um, basically underutilized lands. And we develop renewable energy properties, typically solar, but they can be solar plus storage. In the future, we hope to do energy storage standalone. Um, we go in and we go through all of the interconnection processes, the permitting, the environmental regulatory processes. Um, in some cases, we would work with ORES for larger projects. In other cases, we work with local municipalities for small, smaller ones. Um, Can you say what ORES is? Sorry, it's the Office of Renewable Energy Siting, which is part of the state. It took over for the Article 10 projects. Right. So it provides a one permitting planning source for the larger projects throughout the state. Thanks. I just try to, you know, keep it yeah, transparent for, 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 for folks that aren't in the know as much. There's a lot of acronyms. <laughs> I, I agree. Um, as part of the process, we develop host community benefit agreements, pilots. We work all of those things out. Um, we are a public entity, so we're not profit driven. Um, so we can try to make everyone whole and do the best for everyone. Um, patient capital, there's no tax equity investor breathing down our throat to hit COD, commercial operation date, in a given year. Um, we have funding to go through this development cycle. And that's not to say that we don't want to move rapidly because we're, we're, we're getting close to 2030. So um, in any case, we are responsible for all the work. We work in partnership with, with local municipalities to do all the work as, as we are here. 
So you're probably familiar with a bunch of the community solar projects, which top out at five megawatts AC. That's considered a distributed generation project. We start there and go up in size. Um, we'll get into more detail in this project, but this is about 10 to 13 megawatts. Um, and as you can see, we need about five to seven acres per megawatt. And that really depends on what we're building on top of. Landfills may take up more space because they're ballasted, so they don't penetrate the cap. Uh, single axis trackers, that track with the sun, we can squeeze in a little bit more, increase the, the power density per acre. Here's our model in short. Um, we start as, as any private developer would with desktop screening and uh, looking to find the sites, communicating with IDAs, with municipalities and such. Um, we go through an, 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 um, an ins assessment process and as we start to understand whether we have a project, we spend more money and time on that particular project to try to get it across the finish line. Um, at the end, we end up going to auction where we put it out to the private sector and they bid on it. And the bidders will be qualified in our RFP process. And then they'll be invited to bid on the particular project after we've ascertained that they have the wherewithal to conduct those operations. And in fact, most of them will probably already be participants in our tier one large scale renewables project uh, program. Just real quick, municipal led versus the build ready program. As a municipality, you could identify a site, run the RFP yourselves and select a firm to come and build the project and own it and operate it, and then likely sell the power to you in a PPA. Um, that's not really an option here because the costs are so great to interconnect this project to the grid. So um, you could do that, but it probably would not be fruitful. As I mentioned, uh, so a couple of the benefits here, financial, community, and economic. Um, the payment in lieu of taxes, uh, that would be the RPTL 487, Real Property Tax Law, where you can go into a 15-year pilot. Those are with the three taxing jurisdictions. So we would negotiate a pilot with the town, with the county, and with the school district. That's one way to go. Sometimes these go through IDAs. They go through an IDA pilot. Um, another thing that we don't actually have in here is the host community agreement. Sometimes there are things within the host community that they need done, um, help bringing electricity to the landfill, for instance, or other types of public works where we can negotiate that and include it in the package that goes out to tender. Um, community development, infrastructure, sometimes there are recreational opportunities uh, that we can, we can put into the master plan for a site. Um, and then obviously there's some economic development um, in terms of construction jobs and potential for, for actually training folks. As we move through the process, we're not quite here yet, but we plan to interact with the community to let them know who we are, what we're doing and what the benefits are to gather feedback from the community and try to put it in. We keep people up to date with where we are in the process, how it's going, et cetera. Um, in some cases, it's, well, in most cases, these are great sites because they're not really being used for something. We're not taking over ag land. We're not taking agricultural land. Um, we're not changing the view shed necessarily. This is a pretty well tucked away site. So we don't anticipate any problems moving forward, but we try to be transparent throughout the whole process. Benefits and drawbacks, this is really, uh, we move slower, right? As, as uh, the state of New York. We are the state of New York. Now, having said that, we are lithe and nimble. We are the skunk works in NYSERDA. We have a lot of fun doing this and we are cranking at, at high speed. However, we have to go through all of our processes. Um, so that's just the way it is. Benefits, uh, community benefits, we are mission driven. Obviously, this is what we're doing. We love it. Uh, patient capital, turnkey, we do everything together. And then uh, county influence, let's see. To influence project rather than a private developer doing it. Oh, yeah, of course. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. Um, I want to give you a quick example of a project up in the Adirondacks that we've just received permit approval from the Adirondack Park. Uh, agency authority, and it's called the Benson Mines Project. It's up in St. Lawrence County in the town of Clinton. It's uh, actually, 
it's operational, uh, an iron mine, and they have a bunch of land that is covered with the iron, with the tailings from the mine. And so we've developed a 20 megawatt project there. And this will be the first one that goes out to auction. Uh, yeah, there we go. So the, the, the hash marked area is the project area where we've designed it. So we'll actually do the layouts and the, you know, we don't go all the way to construction drawings, but we have everything all set so that, um, so we have engineers that work with us. Um, that's the site. And I think this week we're getting in our other permits with the town and the county um, highway. Um, we've done all the, you know, the wetland delineations and the studies. Uh, we're in the process of negotiating pilots. Um, I think this one may go through the IDA, but um, it's looking great. Any questions on that or anything else? All right. So just real quick, um, no one's using the site. It's a dump. It's iron tailing. So we are repurposing it and creating green electricity on the site. Um, the landowner will receive lease payments. Um, we do everything. It's turnkey. Um, we work with the community and the public. Uh, and then um, the landowner maintains ownership. So they have another revenue stream from, from that property. Um, and then obviously the pilot payments will go in to the local community and county. With that, I'll turn it over to Ed. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah. And so the Casmel Solar Project aligns perfectly similar can, to Benson can, Mine can, Site. Can, um, where, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Thanks. Yeah, the Caswell Solar Site uh, aligns perfectly just like the Benson Mine Site did. Uh, or the Caswell Solar, yeah, not Caswell Mines. Um, it's about 112 acres project area. But after we take away all the forested land and some of the wetlands and some other things, we get about 83 acres of buildable acreage. Um, and that involves three different parcels uh, that you can see one where the, the main landfill is, uh, another one just to the east, which has part of the landfill. You have that forested area and that uh, wetland that's actually a, a man-made wetland um, to the east as well. And then to the north, there's a uh, area that was, I think for expansion at one time, but it's, it's not, wasn't being used at all. So those are the three parcels. And so this, you know, fits again with the land, with the build ready program, because it's a landfill site, it's, it's a difficult site that a solar developer is probably not going to be looking at. Uh, like uh, Gillian has said, we're going to get anywhere from 10 to 13 megawatts, which again meets the build ready program thresholds. There is nearby electrical infrastructure, we're going to need some upgrades, but there's the Peruville substation just to the north of this. Uh, the topography fits well too, it has some slope, but not uh, anything significant. Uh, one of the great things is it's a nominated site. So we don't, you know, it's something that the, the county was actually looking into and we don't have to negotiate with that owner and we can actually contact the owner, which is always a, an issue sometimes with these sites. And then we did meet with the town planner as well. So he's aware of the site and it's permitted within the town and he's been uh, already engaged in the process. And then I just want to clarify, that's the town of Dryden. Town of Dryden, okay. sorry. I, I'm just looking here and I'm not sure if it actually says town of Dryden on these this page here, so. Right. Yep, I'm gonna dry it in 527 Caswell. So we did have done some research on the landfill. We know it was closed in 1985. We know there's some post-closure monitoring and maintenance, including some of the sampling, the leachate collection. Um, so we're, we're aware of that. And we know that uh, when we develop the site um, that we'll have to uh, take that into account. So some frequently asked questions that we've had with uh, other projects are, you know, what are the lease rates gonna be? So right at this point, it's kind of premature to talk about those, but those will be negotiated and it really is based on the financial model. Uh, the community benefits, um, we would love you to propose some ideas. And again, that's all depending on what the financial model is as well. Uh, the lease term is a 25 year term. Um, and I think it can be renewed every five years after that for five times, I believe. Right. Um, I talked about the DEC requirements. We will definitely be working closely with DEC before we send this out to auction to make sure that we're meeting all of their compliance uh, regulations and probably doing an engineering report to um, have a plan together so they can review that. Uh, and as Gillian said, uh, we will control the landfill risks by having ballasted system and of course controls on construction and where uh, trucks go and things like that. So. So in terms of the next steps, this is when this is a picture of when we actually went up to the site and looked at the site and walked it. Um, 
But we're looking to, one of the main objectives of coming today is to see if we can eventually get a memorandum of under, understanding uh, executed um, by the legislature so that uh, NACERTA can, can then take the next steps to do some advanced engineering and some more uh, detailed review of the site so they can start to develop it to get it to that auction phase. Uh, we also want to make sure we have um, community engagement with the town, stakeholders, any other groups within the county we need to meet with. We'd like to do that. Uh, like Gillian said, we're trying to be as transparent as possible. And then, of course, scoping with the utility. Uh, they need to know about the project, we need to work with them. And of course, we talked about the DEC um, with the county because they have the agreements for the landfills. So um, that's all we have for today. And again, it's just an overview. I'm sure there's some details that you might have some questions about. Um, but uh, here we are. Do you have any questions? Thank you for being crisp. I appreciate that. <laughs> May, I add, may I add yeah. one thing? Sure. We are actually conducting the wetland delineation on the site this week. So we have our team out there. Typically, we would wait until we have an executed MOU so that we have site control and some certainty before we spend that money. But uh, time is of the essence. We're going to have snow before too long. So we got the crew out into mm -hmm. the field. Um, they should finish that up at the end of the week. Okay, great. I also wanted to say thank you for the, your presentation was exactly what was in the booklet, which is, which is a rarity. <laughs> a lot of times by the time people get here, they have changed their presentation. So thank you very much for that. So I have a couple of questions, but I'm going to open it up to my uh, colleagues first. Deborah. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify, this isn't going to cost us anything, right? No, just in some time, really. Why would we say no? I don't know. Okay, thank you. Greg? So this is in, in my district. Um, I just wanted to make sure that, I know, um, Terry, we, we talked, you've been in communication with the town and there didn't seem to be any objection from, from the town or... Yeah, so far we haven't heard any. So Ray Berger, the town planner, came with us on the site visit. He's seen the same presentation. Um, we made the town board aware of this presentation today as well. We're hopeful that they'll they'll watch and they'll send any questions. But thus far, we haven't heard any opposition now. Okay. Yeah, and I think to, to Deb's point, if this is a yeah, yeah, this is a good thing all around. Hopefully, right, devils in Randy. the details. Randy. Thank you. Um, would this have to go through like a site plan review by the town? Okay. Um, and uh, um, so issues on if they have a solar law, they have to deal with whatever solar law they have there. Solar law. Yep. Um, the, uh, um, my experience with, um, I was at a planning board and dealt with this as, as, as Enfield, and neither one of them were very happy how it went in the long run. Um, and when the developers came in, they didn't do what they said they were going to do, uh, leading, meaning leaving the land. But this is a different animal because the county owns the land. Uh, but that was an issue. Um, the, uh, and, and when they got done, since they were out of state developers every, every time to get, and then they sold it off. They, so they develop it and they sell it off to find the right person. Uh, they didn't do their plantings. They didn't do all those kinds of things. That they, they did a lot of work in Enfield where they just came in and just cleared the site. It was pretty bad what they did on, on uh, is that Applegate Road? Yeah. Um, but uh, um, is there, are there any in-state developers doing this kind of work? Almost everybody is, seems to be out of state. There, there are. There are plenty of in-state developers. There are also plenty of, of national developers who have operations here in New York State or around the Northeast. Um, I worked for developers in the private sector for years, and we were all New York based. Um, the, the, the thing I would ask you to think about here is that we've got a bit of a different situation because it's NYSERDA, who even though we're auctioning it, NYSERDA and New York State's names are always going to be imprinted on this project. And so we have, yeah, there's no room for error, right? Is I guess is what I'm saying. I'm really sorry to hear that those sites weren't weren't built out. I've heard that a couple times, and I'm making a list. So if you don't mind, I'd love to if you can jot those down, or maybe I can ask Terry. Can you send me those? Oh, um, I'll do that. Yep. The the it's common for for and I don't want to take too much of your time, but it's common for projects to change hands over time. A developer will come in, like any commercial developer, and take a site from greenfield through to construction. They'll typically be sold prior to construction. 
the buyer will finance the construction, build it, start owning and operating it for seven years to monetize the tax benefits. Right. And they'll restructure the construction debt to longer term debt. And then it eventually makes it into the hands of a pension fund or an infra infrastructure fund. And that's, that's kind of the typical arc for ownership. It's always, the project is always an LLC that is built for assignment. So all of the approvals, all the leases, et cetera, are all included in there. Now, I will say that the planning board and unfortunately the code, the code enforcement offices are the where the rubber hits the road, right? So if things aren't being built to plan, somebody has to raise their hand. And it's it's hard to throw something like that onto, onto local municipalities. So um, I've worked, yeah, I've been doing it for a long time and I've seen it done properly, but I've also seen it done poorly. So, sorry. It's a, it's a fairly simple math equation when you get down to it, isn't it? The, um, but I'm curious, um, can municipalities own <laughs> solar fields? Yeah, that's a great question. Terry and I have been discussing that a little bit. To date, uh, it hasn't really been financially reasonable or uh, feasible because of the value of the tax credits and the depreciation for which you can't benefit. However, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act has added in a new funding mechanism whereby a nonprofit or a municipality can take direct payments of those federal tax credits. So that, I think it was at 24, I think it's at 24 now, it may be bumping up to 30% once again. So that is an option that Terry and I have started discussing. Um, and I'm, it's early stage right now, but I've been testing that idea with the leadership at NYSERDA, and I think people are receptive to it. So that model would be a hybrid between the two that I just presented, where Build Ready, and this is all, you know, could be, Build Ready could develop the project as we are, and then instead of auctioning it to a buyer, we would auction it, well, we would do it on behalf of the municipalities, um, and get an EPC, engineering procurement and construction company to come and build it. And we would help, I suppose, to negotiate that EPC contract. So those builders would work for you guys or who, whoever controls the site. And then you'd have, you know, they'd be on the hook for a couple of years afterwards or one year afterwards for O&M operations and maintenance. And then you'd have an operations and maintenance contract. And these things are largely self-sufficient, right? They just kind of run. You have scheduled maintenance, torque bolts, check electrical connections, um, make sure the trees don't die, die that, that are supposed to screen it, um, replacement over, over time. And if the county is is truly interested in exploring that, then then we're willing to, to give it some work and see if it can happen or not. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Is that something we'd like them to at least think about? That personally, yes, but I don't can't speak for anybody else. But yeah. I think so. It's a, it's a change in our model, right? Our 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 mandate was to auction these to the private sector, but that model was developed and codified in in law um, before the Inflation Reduction Act, before this new bit of information came out. So. It, it's something I think that's worth exploring a little bit more. I mean, mm -hmm. right now we're seeing energy prices rise and in some ways the county is insulated from this because we have some energy supply contracts. Um, unfortunately, those are expiring next year. So we will lose some of that and will be exposed essentially starting next year until we sign a new contract. Um, you know, owning the generation has its benefits. You know, we see that with the Waterloo facility where we know how much we're gonna pay for electricity that's generated by that Waterloo facility. This could be that same sort of idea where if we own that generating asset, we know how much, you know, we're paying essentially for electricity. Now, obviously solar is variable, the generation amount is variable, but it's gonna be close enough that we're gonna have a pretty good understanding year to year and it'll insulate us somewhat from those rising electricity prices. So it, it's worth considering. Can I ask when next year our current contracts expire? Yeah, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit more to the legislature about this in December, but it's gonna expire in November of next year. Okay, thank you. So uh, building off of what uh, some of my colleagues were asking for the, when the, it's up for sale if, uh, oh, you had a question first, you were waiting. So I'll let, let Greg go first. Yeah, I, I guess to, to this 
most recent conversation, I, I think it would be interesting to look at the economics of, of both models and, and make a fully informed decision. Um, so if it's not too much of an exercise, I think it'd be a worth, worthwhile one and hopefully something that could maybe be a model for other municipalities in the future. Um, to, to some of Randy's question and um, Gillian, right? Yeah. To some of, to, uh, some of your comments about NYSERDA and New York State being on the project, if it were to go the private development route, what mechanism do you have as sort of a steward of the project to ensure that those those things are getting done or what what I guess is the involvement through or as soon as the auction is over, your name's still on the project, but I guess what's the continued relationship through through time? Good, good question. Um, so as I understand it, we have two mechanisms. One is the contracting. So we put everything in the contract and they are required to deliver on the contract. So all of the tenants, all of the, the HCA, the host community agreement, the pilots, how they build, how they screen, all of the promises that are made have to be kept within the contract. Secondly, we hold the purse strings, not to be crass, but we, we, we establish a rec that is more valuable than the rec. A renewable energy certificate. Yes, a renewable energy certificate. So any project can bid into what's called the tier one program and they can bid in and get a rec to pay for offset some of their costs. And it's basically for the environmental attributes of each kilowatt hour that's injected into the grid by this solar project or wind project. Um, as I mentioned, we're increasing the value of that only for build ready projects because they're built on these types of environments. Um, and so I think we can, we have some leverage because we're paying them annually for these recs, I guess is the simple answer. I think the other piece is because it's a vetted process, the state is deciding who can bid onto these projects. And I'm, I'm guessing that if it didn't go well, they probably wouldn't be invited back for, for future consideration. This is true. And they're all participating. The bulk of the respondents will be either are or will be participants in NYSERDA programs at the tier one level. So they have, uh, they have everything to lose. So that uh, was one of my questions. So thank you, Greg. I'll just add on to that. Is there anything to stop when, say, they're not bought by a municipality, that for them to be eventually bought by an over overseas uh, entity? No, I mean, I'd say probably not, right? Once the company bids and buys the project, they, it's theirs to, to develop and fund how they would. You know, it's gonna be a mix of on balance sheet funding, some debt finance, some equity finance. The tax equity investors will be US taxpayers, right? Somebody with tax exposure who can take advantage of those, those benefits. Um, and the investment funds tend to be local, but uh, you know, there's nothing to say that it wouldn't. Now we will have some requirements that, um, uh, that they work with unions to, to try to negotiate with the unions for pricing uh, or wage, uh, prevailing wage. Um, by American, there's some provisions in some of our more recent offshore wind solicitations that have requirements for certain percentage of, I believe labor, but definitely materials. So there's that. But in terms of the investment dollars, we don't, we don't have any control over that. It's not coming from Iran, but you know, we don't have any control over it. Thank you, and I'm glad to hear about the labor and the materials. Is there um, any provision to encourage, because I know part of the CLCPA is about you know, creating and uh, supporting New York jobs. Is, it, is there any provisions regarding the, the contractors or the, the folks who are doing the construction to be within New York? I don't know. 100%. We haven't built out our RFP or our final contract yet. It's, it's in the process right now. Um, but there are, there are requirements that the winning bidder negotiate with local labor unions. So those folks okay. would get the first crack at the jobs. Um, okay, great. Yeah. All righty. Um, any other questions before? So why don't we, we have a resolution. So why don't we get that on the floor. Uh, so this is on 
packet page 55. Resolution DOC ID 11242, authorization to execute memorandum of understanding with New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA, for feasibility study, Caswell Solar Array. Uh, Greg, seconded by Deborah. Okay. Any more questions before we vote on this? I just want to mention that mm -hmm. this was reviewed by our lawyer, Bill Troy, and also by administration, so it's been vetted ahead of time. Great. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor? That passes unanimously. I really wanna thank you, Ed and Gilliam and Terry for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to working with you. Likewise, thanks for taking the time out. <laughs> all right, now we're a minute behind. We were ahead, but we're pretty close. So uh, we're gonna go right to Nick. How are you, Nick? I, I'm doing all right. How about yourselves? Good. I know you have a, a bunch of resolutions here and um, we have budgeted about 10 minutes for you. So we're going to have you be crisp too. And we'll, we'll try and be crisp also. Sounds good. Yeah. Let me um, get situated here real quick. I've got the, I'll go ahead and just kind of scan over the the um first item which is just a, our quarterly report it's in there for your reference if you have questions about it feel free to let me know okay I think some, some bits of it you may have heard through other staff and previous meetings particularly regarding the uh, room tax so i'll go ahead and just leave that at that um and let me let's go to the first resolution which uh back at page 64 yeah. Do you want me to move that first, and then you can tell us about that? Let's go ahead. Yeah, let's just keep it keep it moving. Okay. Um, resolution, packet page sixty four, award of twenty twenty two tourism uh, capital grants, uh, moved by Greg, seconded by Deborah. And want to tell us a little bit about that, Nick? Yeah, absolutely. So the tourism capital grants; um, these are uh, investments in uh, sort of two types of projects. One is uh, feasibility studies to look at uh, whether or not a project uh, should move forward or, or how, how much a project is going to cost uh, for uh, a tourism uh, related uh, p uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second is literally for those expenses uh, to, to make those types of projects happen. So uh, you can see here, this is uh, a slate of awards for the tourism capital grants. We have not um, awarded a tourism capital grants since uh, 2019. So this is a a bit of a, a watershed moment for us uh, <laughs> in terms of returning to something like normal for the tourism program. Um, we've got some really great applications in here. Um, I was able to uh, be a part of the review committee that um, uh, looked at these and, and attend that meeting. And I think they had a really good robust discussion about the benefits and drawbacks of these different, different programs uh, that were proposed. Um, major ones that you see here are listed, the State Theater of Ithaca for their, their lobby expansion project. Um, they are looking uh, for funding to uh, make their lobby a more welcoming and um, engaging space that they can ha have more events in and make it make the operations flow better. It's a, it's a pretty substantial project. Um, Friends of Stewart Park looking at the wayfinding signage, uh, which needs a needs a bit of a refresh. Um, Science Center looking at the um, the playground area in the front of the uh, building facing Route 13. This is a feasibility study, so they'll be engaging with some professionals and assessing the options for that. Uh, town of Ithaca. Uh, this is really a, a multiple municipality uh, study, the town of Ithaca taking the, the lead on the application here uh, for the uh, feasibility of an expansion of the South Hill Recreation Way. They're uh, continuing to negotiate with NYSEG for the uh, um, easement on that, uh, that alignment of the trail. So this would be looking at the engineering and, and uh, feasibility of, of actually building out that trail. Um, Friends of Newman Golf Course, this is uh, related to uh, pending uh, decision on what to do with the, the golf course up by the uh, City Harbor area uh, along the waterfront. Town of Newfield, uh, making some upgrades to the Newfield Covered Bridge area uh, and proposing uh, a, a War Memorial Park in that area as well. Uh, and Trumansburg Conservatory of Fine Arts, uh, looking at uh, uh, a really substantial renovation of that building to improve accessibility um, and uh, the ability for people to attend shows in that venue. Um, the final one there, which is a bit of an odd duck, is the uh, Hangar Theater. 
Um, they had applied for a capital grant. They already had a capital grant on the books with us. It was encumbered funding that had not been um, awarded. They've had a fair amount of uh, staff turnover there. So, uh, and that project was basically dormant. So what we're basically proposing for them is to, to re-scope the funding they already had to fit the application, the new application that they have. So that's more relevant for the, the needs they have today in 2022 than the, uh, the proposal they had from 2019. Um, so that, that there's zero uh, cash moving there, but we're, we're notifying you and, and asking to uh, uh, basically permission to re-scope uh, that, that contract. So, so that's our capital grants. Um, setting, uh, happy to answer any questions. Okay, great. Any questions before we vote? Okay, real, real quick. Real quick, because, okay. Thank you, Nick. So basically all these people, uh, this is funding about one third of each project. Is that how that works? Or? That's correct. That's our maximum is, is one third. Uh, some of them are, are more, uh, some of them are less than one third, I should say. Uh, some of the projects are just larger uh, in, in scope and our and our overall cap for an award is a hundred thousand dollars. So. Thanks. Yep. Okay, great. All those in favor? Great, that passes unanimously, unanimously, which is not easy for me to say, apparently. Okay, so packet page 72, uh, resolution fall uh, 2022 tourism project grant awards, doc ID 11206. If I could have somebody move that. Greg, seconded by Randy. Okay, you wanna tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Project Tourism Project Grant Awards. Uh, the general gist of these awards is that they help drive people to visit our community. They motivate overnight travel. Uh, so uh, this is our fall round of, of uh, grants. Uh, you can see the activities slated here are largely in the winter or spring months, uh, March, April, um, generally. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a nice, nice variety of projects. Um, uh, the uh, Beyond Experience, you may remember, was on the Commons. They're, they're planning to bring that back next March. Uh, Opera Ithaca looking at a uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, festival, which is a unique collaboration with Cornell. Uh, Paleontological Research Association Institution looking at it, uh, proposing an exhibit uh, focused on rocks. Uh, and a new applicant for the tourism program is the Cuga Vocal Ensemble uh, and doing a, doing a performance focused on Alzheimer's. So um, yeah. Happy to answer questions about these projects. Thank well. you. Any questions before we vote? All those in favor? That passes unanimously. Moving right along. Packet page 78. And this is the Fall 2022 Tourism Marketing Grant Awards. Doc ID 11205. Could I have somebody move that one? Randy, seconded by Deborah. Okay. Great. You'll see a lot of overlap with the, the project grant awards here in this list. Um, folks can apply for both at the same time and often do. The one exception here is the Science Center. Um, they apply just for marketing funding to do a, a winter campaign, which uh, was really well received by our, the committee that reviewed these. So uh, yeah, this this is the same general idea as, as marketing to promote overnight visits. Uh, uh, so often paired up with our project grants uh, as a funding part of the funding request. I agree. Any questions before we vote? All those in favor? That passes unanimously. The last one is on packet page 80, resolution uh, for the fall 2022 Community Celebration Grant Awards, doc ID 11204. Can I have somebody move that? Greg moves that, Randy seconds that. Okay, Nick? Super. So yeah, Community Celebrations Grants, these are uh, required to be free and open to the public events. Uh, just the, the general idea here is to uh, show, uh, you know, what is happening in our community and then and, and, and invite people to have a, have a good time at various uh, places. Uh, so, you know, pretty open-ended in terms of, of what can be requested here. We had four, uh, actually we had five applications, four were recommended for funding. Um, the, uh, you'll see them listed in your agenda, in the uh, resolution there. Uh, some of these are, are events that are, three of these, I should say, are events that we've had before. The uh, Dorothy Cotton Jubilee Singers, uh, Groton uh, Cabin Fever, and Ithaca Children's Garden um, are all events that have been happening with some regularity for a few years. Uh, so we're happy to see those back. And then the new one 
at least for us from the tourism program funding side of it is uh enfield cabin fever that is that is not a typo there are, there are two cabin fever events so yeah um uh happy to answer any questions about these i don't think you can have too many cabin fever events uh in the middle of the winter here any questions before we vote all right all those in favor that passes unanimous. And Nick, I want to thank you for helping us go crisply through this. I, uh, I'm sorry we don't have more time. Uh, the uh, I know this accumulates a lot of different work, you know, for you or, or, or a large amount of work for you. So thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome, and thank you for uh, keeping the meeting moving quickly and on time. That's awesome. So I'll let you keep on going. Thanks, guys. Okay, great. Um, just uh, had one question looking at our, um, let's see, our agenda. I think we'll do the uh, Ithaca Green New Deal. Now I, I know, um, and I just wanna ask, and Irene, you have uh, the rate case update. If you want, uh, we could move the, let's see the resolution before that, although I don't know as one's gonna take longer than the other. Um, it, was that be something you could do, Irene, in about five minutes? I know we're not giving you a lot of time. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Uh, I probably will be doing a webinar on this, and so I, you know, I'd be happy to to send a notice and invite people. Um, but five minutes, yeah, not going to cut it. I said once a billion of our dollars, and I think we should spend more than five minutes learning why. So, if you want, I could move things around. And have and hopefully the resolution that we have for the task force, where so I could move that up and then give you the rest of the time up until three thirty. Do you want to? Uh, sure, if that works for you guys, that would be great. Thank you. You just never know what's behind the box, but we could move that around. Just never know how long things are take. But why don't we do that? And uh, but Sarah, why don't we? Because I think. Uh, uh, why don't we do your uh, New Deal update? And yeah, if it's okay, it's, and I'm super brief. I'm um, not clear on why we need to reorganize, but glad that Irene can accommodate. And I just need to um, do my bit, and then probably be be jumping off. Uh, so essentially, I just wanted to let the committee know that the Climate and Sustainable Energy Advisory Board has closely been following events in the city of Ithaca um, and wrote a letter expressing, you know, both support and concern that momentum not be lost with the departure of uh, Luis Aguirre Torres as the director of sustainability. He and Rebecca Evans have accomplished a great deal and it's, um, it's somewhat concerning uh, that, that, that uh, there's been a change there. And the reason that we are following this is that if we look at the energy strategy for Tompkins County, everything that the city of Ithaca pledges to do under the Green New Deal is completely aligned with what our county strategy is. So the city's really been the flagship. It's brought in a lot of attention uh, from media. It's brought in a lot of money and um, in terms of investment commitments. And so we just wanna make uh, legislators aware that, that you know, there, there's a bit of a, um, you know, a hiccup in the process and that uh, in any way that any of you can um, exert influence to encourage the city to move forward with all due speed, we feel that would be appropriate because our, our Fates are connected. Um, Irene, anything else that you want to uh, add to that summary? No, I think that that sounds good, Sarah. Um, just to just to you know endorse what you've just said. Um, it's it's a big loss to the city, and um, hopefully there are ways that that the county and and other groups around the county can help to keep the momentum going. Any questions, Annie or others? I want to uh, thank you and the case board for you know writing this letter. I think it's really important, not just the letter, but the sentiment behind it. You know that we uh, that you support, and and I will say, you know, myself also, you know, and uh, that I support. 
you know, continuing with the Green New Deal and, and with the county, you know, helping as much as, as we can too. Any other comments? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, I, Irene, let me just ask the, the group here too. Um, so we have two things. I'm just, I'm not sure which one, you know, um, whether it's Irene's presentation, I'd like to give time to. I, we also have the resolution for the task force. I wanna make sure we have enough time for. Do, do folks feel one before the other? We have to pass a resolution. So you wanna do the resolution first? Okay. With, are you okay with that still, Irene? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, fine. All right, so why don't we do the resolution first? Okay, so that's on packet page 85. So why don't we move this on the floor first and then we'll start discussion. Uh, Deborah moves that. Uh, this is resolution establishing a task force to review the existing relationship between Tompkins County and the Ithaca Area Economic Development Agency. So Deborah moved it, seconded by Randy. Okay, I'll open it up for discussion. <clears throat> but I think there's, um, we need to drop the agency, I think out of the title if that was a... Yes, right. I don't know if that's friendly to the mover. That yeah, that's friendly. And was it anywhere else in here or just in the title? No, it's in the, it's in line, line four. Line four. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a good area economic development. No the, no agency. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other discussion? Yeah, I, I, um, I'd like to make a motion to amend the resolution to at line 27, um, say resolve further, Lisa Holmes, county administrator will be the chair of the task force. Um, and and I can't pronounce, I'm gonna, I wanna Ann Hader Collins. Ann Hader Collins, uh, her administrative assistant will uh, take detail, detailed notes for the meetings, which will be distributed to all legislators and any other interested parties. The chair of the committee, or sorry, period. The chair of the committee will create a meeting schedule and agenda that will be distributed prior to the meeting period. Uh, and, or I, I guess no and, there will be meeting, there will be meetings where IAD staff will be invited to participate in order to seek feedback and collaboration. So that's all one additional result. Yeah, and we can break it up if we want, but. I, I don't have a problem with any of that. And so it was you and Randy seconded. So Randy, is that okay with you? Okay, so that's just outlining, you know, some more details to that. Craig, can you email that to me? I will, yes. Um, may I? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, the other question that I had, um, just wanted to have brief conversation around the non-voting versus voting members and get others' thoughts on if that should, uh, should be there. I know I was originally... Uh, one that uh, uh, originally supported this resolution coming out of committee and then at the legislature floor uh, did, did oppose this and, and appreciate it coming back and appreciate uh, those that work to make some changes. Um, I still do have a slight, a slight bit of um, issue with the makeup of the committee, uh, but would just be curious on other thoughts if they have any on making those community members uh, voting participants of the task force. Anybody want to chime in? I guess I can't say I'm in favor of that. Uh, you know, we call this a task force, but really I think this is kind of more akin to a performance evaluation of, um, our, of our relationship with IAED and how we would like it to move forward. Um, I, I know that some people seem a little paranoid. It's not that we're trying to cut off our relationship with IAED. I mean, we've had nine years of relationship um, and IAED is our partner in economic development. I know that over the past five years where I've been involved on committees uh, that IAED has reported to, um, the committees have asked for more focus on 
workforce development and the creation of new jobs. Um, we have no metrics or deliverables defined in our MOU that allow us to enforce that or assess if we're getting what we want workforce development wise out of the relationship. And I think that that, from my perspective, is the focus going forward uh, with this task force. Uh, that said, you know, the, this performance evaluation or uh, development of uh, an ask for our upcoming negotiations with IAED is largely internal. Um, we certainly want input from the community, but the ultimate decision as to what we want to ask for when we talk to IAED is an internal one. And so the voting members, as this is proposed, are largely or totally internal. And that's would be my preference. I certainly want to hear from the community, but we're the ones that are making the decision as to what we want to ask IAED for, and then there will be a negotiation. Thanks for laying that out. I, I don't have anything to add to that. That pretty much lays it out how I was, anything I could say and more. Randy? Um, yes, um, you know, I read the letter in, in depth that, uh, that Shauna and Ann uh, put forth, and it seemed to make sense to me. Um, I, uh, I, did, I did have a question on the non-voting members. Are all these people, have they agreed to be on the task force or? Yes, I, I uh, talked to each one of them and asked them um, about being on the task force and uh, to, uh, disclosing, telling them, you know, that, that they were uh, non-voting members. And, and they, they were, they were, they every, were every single one fine was, with that? Yep, yeah, every single one. And I'm really happy that they they were all that was you know that they uh, wanted to you know to help, and the, um, many of them said they're big proponents of what the IAED does. This is just to you know this is not uh, uh, you know anything against against them. This is to help you know and make our relationship I think better. Donna. Yeah, thanks for letting me join today. Um, I second what what Annie and Deborah said in regards to why this task force is being formed. It's not going to be a complaining session. The whole idea is for us to figure out how to have a better relationship. Um, I think, unfortunately, the county's been at fault for some of that over the past few years because we've never really set out expectations of what we expect from our partner, and that's our fault. Um, I think this is a chance for us to get it right and for us to list out what our expectations are and then how we can measure those expectations um, with a metric, some type of metric, metric system so that we come back, whenever we come back in three years and see if this is working or not or how we can make changes, we, we, can, we can have some accountability. Um, with that said, I've been on many task force over the years and there have only been two or three situations where I can actually remember having a true vote. Typically what task force are is a group of people that sit together around the table and have a conversation and you collect consensus. And so that's what I can imagine this being. I'm not saying that there's not gonna be a time where we do a straw poll or whatever, but, but I, I think the, the real question and the real goal is to build consensus about, uh, around this group. Um, to create metrics, to create some account accountability and be um, very transparent about that. So um, the whole idea with us including IAED in the conversation, it's important. I mean, we need their feedback just as much as they need ours um, in building a, an MOU moving forward. Um, so I hope... I hope that is understood. I also want to be very clear about this task force. They're not going to have a 161 page report at the end of this. Um, we are going to take a very 30,000 foot view. Um, we don't have the staff um, to do that, nor is, is that what they're going to be tasked with. Um, so we're looking at what maybe hasn't worked in the past, what needs to work in the future and what our expectations are. Thank you, Shauna. Anything else before we vote? I mean, I have a couple more things, but I, I don't want to 
um, belabor this too long if we don't have to. Um, I'm just curious, because I, I still do, I, I wish there was a different makeup of the legislators on this task force, um, which I've expressed and I've expressed to, to many. Um, but um, just curious, the relationship between GO and IAED? Um, they actually have, most of our resolutions go through GO because it's policies. Um, this will be a partnership with IAED, and we have had um, resolutions that have gone through GEO. And I'm sorry, Greg, I mean, clearly your feelings seem hurt because you weren't part of the task force. No, can, no, can no, we that's not that, no, 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 that's, not, that's, not, that's not it that's at all. That's what it appears to that, be. Well, that's not what he's saying. That's, that's that's, and that's not, I've, again, from the beginning of the conversation, I have said that I am, I am more than okay without being on the task force. I just think that there are, are uh, a, a few people that maybe are on the task force, and I don't want to get into individual names that have been um, very outspoken about uh, their feelings towards IAED and other things, which I don't think we need to get to on the floor right now. Um, but I, I do have concern o over the over the makeup, um, and I think it was done a little bit in a vacuum, and I think there was a potentially greater opportunity. Uh, for involvement or solic solicitation of those desiring to participate in the process. I also think that there should be- uh, Greg, uh, as I shut down Shauna, I am going to, I'm not gonna, I'm, not, I'm not gonna shut you down, but I just wanna say, I want you to think about what you're saying, um, assuming or making, you know, possible inferences or assumptions of what has happened. So just think about as you're, as you're saying that, these are our colleagues. You know, the same thing that I, what I would ask for Shauna and, and Deborah, Randy, everybody for, you know, that's in this committee. So just to, to think about that, uh, yeah, I've, what, I've, you, what you're saying, and, and, and let's assume everybody the best of each other, okay? Yeah, I know, I've, and, and, and I appreciate that. I've thought about that quite a bit. Um, I, um, I also would, would have liked to see there be a, a bipartisan effort in this. Um, a mix of, of parties at the table. Um, I think that's important um, in the conversation. Um, but again, the, the decision's been been made. I think um, uh, hopefully it's a, it's a there's a, a robust outcome and discussion. Um, and then just wanted to know if those meetings would be open or not for others to maybe not participate in, but just to listen into was one of my other questions. And by others, I mean other legislators. Other legislators are always welcome. I mean, that's a different question from whether it's a public meeting of a committee. But no, we're not going to bar the door. <laughs> anything else, Greg? Okay, anything else from other members? Okay, why don't we go ahead and vote? Uh, all those in favor? All those not in favor? Okay, one not in favor. Uh, three in favor, so that passes. Thank you, everybody. And uh, so next we're going to, so uh, I, I, let's see, make sure we don't have anything else. So, to, to do, uh, did committee members have any reports for today or can we just leave the rest of the time to uh, talk about the, uh, the, the rate increase? That, Yes, Deborah. Yeah, I, w I really want to hear from Irene, and she's got 22 minutes by my calculation. Um, but I did want to bring up one thing. I got an email from uh, Peter Badaglio at uh, TICP today that um, the the scoping plan or the, the Irene probably has a better. Yeah, I can I can talk about yeah, that. Yeah, why don't briefly. you mention that as well? Sure. Or, because I'll probably screw it up. <laughs> sure. So um, the CLCPA, our, our nation leading climate law, uh, required the establishment of something called the Climate Action Council to develop, to take the goals of the law, you know, and figure out how do we actually make it happen. And they've worked for three years on that. They have received a report from NYSERDA outlining certain, outlining certain aspects of it. Um, and uh, there were ideas that were brought forward in particular about uh, building electrification and requiring 
that by 2024, new buildings that were seven stories or under be all, all electric. And then I think it was by 2027 for the rest of the buildings, taller buildings. Uh, at the meeting of the Climate Action Council last week, uh, surprising to Bob Howarth, who I'm sure most of you know from Tompkins County, has represented us on that uh, uh, blue ribbon panel, I guess you could call it. Anyhow, uh, took him by surprise and other members when they dialed it back and said, nope, not 2024 anymore. It's going to be 2025 and it's going to be contingent on the international building codes being established. And then we'll have to craft our New York state codes around that and blah, blah, blah. And what's happening, we think, is that uh, the oil and gas industry has been successfully lobbying and people are getting scared and dialing things back. So it's really important uh, that we take a stand and say no backsliding on our on our actions to reach our climate goals. Um, and so I'll be going up to Albany tomorrow along with a couple of other people from Tompkins County to sit in on that meeting at Bob Howarth's request. And also uh, I can, you know, coordinated a, a phone calling thing today to the governor's office, but really any time that you can call the governor's office to say no backsliding uh, 2024, guess no more. Um, would be great. Thanks, Irene. Sure. Thank you. Ready yeah. to do the rate case? Sure. First, I just want to thank you guys for, for tackling uh, the IDA uh, issue. I, I, you know, I'm sorry for, for the wrinkles uh, interpersonally or, you know, in terms of how to structure it, but this has long been needed and I'm really excited to see um, this conversation happening. So thanks for taking that on. All right. So um, on with the show, I should share my screen. Yeah. Is that what we're up to? Okay. Um, actually, let me first get it on my screen here. Uh, okay. Okay. Share screen. Nice, a great case. And uh, thank you all for making um, time. To, to hear this out. It's it's never straightforward to talk about a rate case. Uh, so this is my second rate case being fully involved in. Um, they roll around every three years. Uh, and the, so the last one was in 2019. Um, and this will be for, you know, rates starting in 2023. This is just a, an overview map of NYSEG's service area. You can see that um, there's some people who get just electricity, some up in the North Country that just get gas, and many that are, you know, the darker red get both electricity and gas. All told, they've got roughly uh, 900,000 electric customers and 300,000 gas customers. They also run uh, RG&E, the Rochester Gas and Electric, but I'm not including those figures in, in this talk today. Um, so what is a rate case? Well, to understand what a rate case is, you need to understand a little bit about what utilities are. And utilities are a regulated monopoly. And if you look at this actual picture of New York City back in 1888, um, this is what our world would look like if they weren't regulated. Somebody finally had the good sense to say, oh my God, we're gonna have wires everywhere if, you know, if there's all these different companies competing to give us phone service or electric service or, or whatever. And so um, they gave uh, companies monopoly power to cover certain territories, but they said, you can't just run yourself as a monopoly, you have to be regulated. So who does the regulating is uh, two sort of interrelated uh, Things. The P Department of Public Service, Department of Public Service, or DPS, is the state agency that reviews and regulates the utility. Um, they have as their voting board the Public Service Commission, the PSC. So they you know, they're really it's the same same agency. And I just wanted to break that out because it often gets confusing. So, um, so every one to three years, 
uh, the utility proposes uh, their rates of what are the new uh, things they want to add to, you know, to their infrastructure and programs, research, IT, staffing, payroll, and shareholder profits. Um, I emphasize the idea that these are delivery costs, and I'll show you, I think it's the next slide that'll show you what I mean by that. Um, and then, so then what happens is that the utility, the Department of Public Service, and stakeholders all negotiate um, to come up with a joint proposal, and I should say, or not. Um, and honestly, in the way that this freight case is being proposed, I think or not is going to be where we end up. So back to what do I mean by delivery? There's two different components of your electric bill, if you ever, or, or gas bill, if you look closely. There's the supply costs and there's the delivery charges. And the delivery charges is what the utilities um, provide us. They provide us not the electricity generation and cost of the electrons or cost of the gas molecules. They provide us the infrastructure. They provide us the pipes or the wires to bring it to our homes. And so all of the costs involved in doing that is what gets paid for in a rate case. Um, now, NYSEG does essentially as, as a service to us, as a pass-through service, they um, buy electricity and buy uh, gas and uh, pass through those costs to us. So uh, we've heard already that that uh, cost of gas again this year and you know the war in Ukraine and, and all the craziness with OPEC and you know on and on, um, we're going to have higher gas costs this year. That is not NYSEG's doing, that's separate. Um, and you know more on, on a world basis um, that that's all playing out. But it certainly is going to impact all of us as ratepayers. But then in addition, NYSEG is looking to increase their rates. So who are the stakeholders in a rate case? In addition to NYSEG and the Department of Public Service, there's environmental organizations and sometimes individuals. There are other uh, public interest nonprofits. Uh, AARP, for example, represents seniors. And, and there's a fabulous organization called PULP, the Public Utility Law Project, that represents low and moderate income participants or, or um, rate payers. Uh, municipalities, Westchester County is in. And this year, and thanks to Katie, and, and especially thanks to Haley, um, uh, Tompkins County is being represented in, in the rate case. Uh, there's a, a, a law firm and industry uh, uh, association that represents industry and large commercial entities, and then some are also on their own. So Walmart's on their own, Newport Steel is on their own, multiple interveners represents any number of large users. Um, there are trade associations and unions, um, special interest businesses like, you know, the ones that put in car charging stations, uh, and then other state agencies the New York Power Authority, um, Empire State Development, and Department of State. The process is a long one. It started in May of this year, and it will finish in likelihood, but not necessarily in, 20, in May of 2023. So what happened is the utility files their rate case, um, and then all people who want to get involved join as what are called parties. And we spend a lot of time filing questions to each other. Uh, they're known as interrogatories or information requests or IRs, but you know, to, to us regular people, they're question and answers. Um, and that, that goes on for quite a while. And after a while of having done that, uh, and so really between May and uh, this uh, September, there were lots of IRs filed and then uh, the, the um, DPS staff and other and other stakeholders, other parties can file testimony. And then after their testimony comes in, there can be rebuttal if you dif disagree with something that, that some of those other parties have said. The testimony is testimony versus what the utilities have asked for. There just were public hearings a couple of weeks ago, and we are on the brink of starting negotiations, which will start in November. Uh, neg negotiations are confidential. 
uh, and they can go on for quite a period of time or not so much. If it seems as though you're not going to reach a settlement, um, then you would uh, push towards having an evidentiary hearing, which is a litigated decision on the rates that have been proposed. Um, my guess is that we're not going to reach a settlement on this. Uh, my conversations with other parties in the case uh, seems to indicate that we're pretty unanimous in thinking that the, the rate increase that NYSEG is asking is astronomical um, and uh, that none of us seem to be able to find a way to support it. I, you know, things can change in settlement. I'm open to that. I think all of the parties are, but uh, from the looks of it at the starting point, it, it doesn't seem very good. So an evidentiary hearing, I Irene, hear from a judge. Sorry. Irene, what's the yeah. uh, percentage of increase? We'll, we'll get to that, in. Okay. I wanted to lay out the process first and, and uh, then we'll get into what they're asking for. Um, so, so anyhow, a judge will decide um, and ultimately the Public Service Commission can accept, reject, or revise uh, the recommendations that come out of the evidentiary hearing. The standard of review is whether or not it serves the public interest um, in terms of building a safe and reliable system, um, just and reasonable rates, aligning with our environmental and social goals, whether it's fair to shareholders and represents a compromise between the adversarial parties. So here's the rate increase that NYSEG is, has proposed is a 34.9% increase in their electric side or $278.5 million more. Uh, and on their gas side, uh, they uh, asked for 35 or 30.5 million more um, and a return on equity. So, so the gas company shareholders uh, loan some money to build some of the infrastructure and then the rest gets uh, externally financed. And, and they want on the money that they loan uh, to, do the, to do the infrastructure build out 10.5% uh, rate of return, which is enormous and crazy. Um, so, so then we, we take a look at, uh, I'm gonna just compare this first uh, run through. NYSEG told us that this amount of increase, uh, almost a 35% increase, um, would result in $18.31 more per month for the average residential customer. Multiply that by 12, you find out that it would increase the electric delivery costs only. So we're not even looking at the supply costs yet. $200 and, $220 increase in in uh, the delivery costs. And then on the gas side, it would be uh, $15 a month more or $180 more per year um, for gas customers. Um, and again, these are just for delivery, not for supply costs. So, so all told, it's almost, what is that? $400 a year increase uh, for the average residential customer. Irene, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, of course. About these numbers, how do they reconcile that they're asking for a 34.9% increase for electricity, but it's only going to make a 22% increase in people's monthly residential? It, yeah, th so there's there's um, what they call rate allocation. And, oh, okay. and it, different customers end up having different... Um, portions of, you know, proportions of the rate um, allocated to them. So, so that's how um, that comes out. But also this is a, yeah. So I, yeah, that's the, that's the easiest. Um, so, so then what happens? So this is what NYSEG's original proposal was. Then as I just described, there's the opportunity for um, testimony. Department of Public Service Commission came back and said, no, 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 we're cutting you back. And honestly, this, I, Gas is cut back significantly. This is, you know, it's a cutback, but it's not that much of a cutback. And now, so so this is, becomes part of the ping pong game. And so now um, NYSEG says in their rebuttal testimony to staff, no, 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 you got it all wrong. We really need these things. And so, you know, we'll shave off nine tenths of a percent um, here. And here we actually have increased 
by a tenth of a percent. So, um, so the ping pong game has started, uh, and we're about to go into settlement discussions. Um, I want to put these increases in context of what the arrears are right now and terminations as of NYSEG's latest filing on this. Uh, so the filings lag by a month. They put it in in September. It reflects what happened in August. Now, August is particularly interesting because there was a moratorium on utility shutoffs related to COVID. And then after that moratorium ended, which I think was in January, there was then a six month, uh, you know, sort of figure it out period where there still weren't going to be shutoffs, but they really needed to get everybody al aligned in what to happen. So really, August is the first time that terminations started happening again. I, I just want to show you these numbers are astonishing. There are 110,000 customers, that's almost 10% of, of NYSEX customers, around 10% of their customers that are 60 days overdue. And collectively they owe almost $60 million. Um, 78,000 of them had a termination notice sent to them in August. Um, and the total arrears for those that are about to be terminated is $44 million. And there were 64 people actually terminated. Um, we'll see what happens with their September report, which should be due out. Actually, it should be due out very, very soon. Um, and, you know, and, and going forward. But this is horrifying and really frightening uh, as we come into winter at a time when we know that gas prices for the supply are going up. Um, and also, you know, electricity costs are going to be up as well. Um, this is just really frightening. And, and it's hitting businesses even. This isn't just individuals. This is commercial. They're also finding themselves five businesses. Five businesses got closed by NYSEG. Irene, we have uh, three minutes left. Oh, shit. Okay. Um, <laughs> Wait, sorry. You said a public meeting? <laughs> Sorry. So, so um, the return on equity uh, it, over from the 10 years, 2010 to 2019, the companies, uh, NYSEG and RG&E co together collected 1.18 billion. Um, in 2020 alone, while we were all enduring COVID, they collected another 300 million. Um, their rate case proposal, these are their ongoing expenses. They want deferred costs, core business costs, policy compliance, reliability, and other. What's important here is that um, these deferred costs and policy compliance are, are important. Deferred costs are left over from last rate case that didn't get paid because their rate charges were too high and they need to recoup them at some point. Um, policy compliance is to align with the CLCPA, core business improvements, reliability. We wanna see all of this stuff happen, but it's just crazy expensive. But here's, What's also crazy is the Department of Public Service reviewed their proposals and said they that there wasn't enough information. It lacked crucial information. The answers when they filed Q&A were insufficient. And that overall, it was a vague, inconsistent answers or failed to provide necessary documentation. The cap, the that, gas, isn't that the same stuff they said for the last rate case? It is the same thing they said on the electric side last time around. Um, and this time the gas side said it as well, that there are significant concerns, lack of transparency, um, multiple rounds of questions and only vague responses. This is an outrage. This is a freaking outrage. Meanwhile, I do wanna talk about one important thing in the rate case in regards to reliability is vegetation management, which has been an ongoing issue. I know that many of you guys have endured power outages. NYSIG is the only utility in the state that is not on a uh, five-year trim cycle to get to get rid of tree contacts from 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 the wires um 48 almost half half of their um interruptions back in 2019 were from from tree contacts um they still have 12,000 miles that haven't been trimmed in at least five years 
and many of them not even trimmed in 10 years. And they keep proposing to get on a five-year trim cycle, which, you know, of course, costs money to, to reclaim the stuff that hasn't been done and then to maintain everything else. Um, and each year, the staff has denied them the full funding to do it. Um, this time, they're proposing instead of a five-year, get on a six-year trim cycle. There's no justification for this. Um, they haven't provided any. Staff just pulled it out of a hat, said they're doing it in some parts of Florida and South Carolina, and we should try it here. Well, no. Um, so our testimony said to reject the proposal for the rate increase. Instead, the rate case should be dismissed as incomplete. NYSEG should either withdraw it voluntarily or the PSC should order a dismissal and resubmit when it's complete. And if there's still problems, reduce the return on equity. Um, in the settlement, if we, you know, when we do get into settlement, we're gonna insist that the rate increase not be more than inflation of 8%, that they must have a five-year trim cycle, um, no winter shutoffs, no summer shutoffs if it's more than 90 degrees, that NYSEG must apply for the IRA funds to cover um, costs for any of the capital projects that they want to do. That's what that money's there for. We shouldn't have to bear it as ratepayers. Um, and then uh, there is a way to calculate a standard ROE, and I think they should be dinged at least at half a percent um, for their lousy application. Um, I finish up here just with some poverty data in Tompkins County to just drive home how crazy and unjustified this rate increase is. Um, so so thanks for letting me whiz through that. I don't know if any of you are still here. Uh, stop share. Um, and I, I expect that, that uh, the planning department is going to have their own filing to put forward. I, I haven't talked with Haley or Terry to find out how that's shaping up and what they're going to propose, but, but this is really an outrage. And um, I, you know, I expect that that their comments will, <laughs> will will probably be a little bit more tame in terms of their language, but uh, express similar sentiments. Thanks, Irene. That was really well presented. Yeah, thank you very much, Irene. And and uh, yes, if you could send us a link, we'll send it to all the legislators. You know, when you sure. do uh, another presentation, you know, especially look, you know, look forward to uh, really uh, digestible data. And uh, and and lively uh, verbiage from you as always. <laughs> uh, any last comments? Thank you very much, Irene. And it's uh, I've heard some of this before, but it's it's nice that you packaged it all in something really digestible for us. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, and continue it, the great work that you're doing on this, which is even more important. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Have fun. I miss coming to your meetings. Good, good hanging out with you. Well, you're welcome to come in person next time. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks again. Anything else before we adjourn? I want to consider three percent, a three second delay now on Thomas. <laughs> 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 the I Irene Weiser three second delay. <laughs> we just need a beeper when she presents. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank thanks, you, Brittany. Annie. Thank you, everybody. Whew, we got through it.